I'll let you guys go ahead. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Can you guys uh, see my screen? Yep. Excellent. So I'd like to start things off here. Uh, I'd like to introduce my, my colleague and friend here, Hanyal Kroitoro, who I completely just wrecked his name. I apologize. Um, I work with uh, Haniel at uh, Protivity, and he is a fantastic uh, MVP in the Power Apps uh, area. He's also a speaker, as you can well see, and he is a fantastic author as well. How are you doing, everybody? Um, great meeting you today. So like I said very quickly, uh, uh, Associate Director with Protivity, focusing very heavily on the Power Platform. Mm -hmm. uh, been working in uh, SharePoint Office 365 for nearly 20 years now, uh, probably a bit over that. Uh, really excited to be here today. Um, and then, David, um, I got to pass it back to you. Sure. Um, my name is David Drever. I am a senior manager with Protivity. Uh, I've been a Office Apps um, and Services MVP for six years, five years, I can't remember. And um, I, uh, I'm a speaker. And in my my uh, spare time, I have been known uh, to, to do a little bit of farming. I'm part time farmer. Which, which kind of brings us to uh, a little bit of a, uh, a quirk we have in our presentation here. You'll notice on some of our slides, we have this little cow that shows up here, and we, we call that our cow tips. So any, any special um, tips we have, uh, things we've learned over the years, um, just simple things that may not be too obvious, you know, just take a look for that cow tip, and, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Awesome, all right, so, uh, you know, we talked a lot about Power Automate. Um, you can tip the car if you want. That's totally up to you. We don't take any responsibility for it, though. So uh, when we talk about Power Automate and Power Apps and all of this, this uh, you know, uh, automation business, there's a lot of hype about it. What's the big deal? Uh, and so there's a number of drivers that a lot of organizations are using to, to really help them uh, uh, or, or justify the, the investment in this kind of a platform for it. Uh, the first one is saving time. So uh, uh, there's no doubt that any process that you do manually, whether it's filling out a form or, or copying data from one place to another, no, no, uh, no challenge to say that the computer is going to do it faster than a person. So saving time is definitely one, uh, one factor that plays into it. Uh, reducing waste. So. It's 2021, we still see situations where when an employee wants to go on vacation, they're going to have to go to the internet, download and print a document, fill out the vacation request form, scan it, email it to their boss who then has to print it and sign it, and then scan it back in and send it to HR to then be put into the, you know, uh, a workday or whatever HR system they have. Uh, that is unfortunately still the reality today. With automation, we can eliminate all this paper and all this this manual processing, uh, so you're you're reducing the overall waste footprint for the company. Um, and then there is reducing risk. So David Driver, good friend of mine, I trust him. If I want to send Dave an email uh, or or even just automatically do something, um, there are some other Daves I know. They're a little bit more shady, so I got to be really careful. I can make a mistake and let's say I wrote an email to one of those other Daves and when I just go to Outlook and I just type quickly Dave and I hit send and there's some confidential information, guess what? Once that email went out, it's gone. There's no way for me to prevent it. So by using automation, computers don't, will, don't make that kind, of, that kind of mistake, right? They are programmed to follow certain rules. So as long as Dave Driver is in the good books and he is supposed to receive a message, he will receive it. Um, growing your business. So I talked initially about saving time and, and doing manual tasks. Imagine those employees who are today doing very manual data entry or processing. Now they have free time on your hands. They can actually focus on building the business and, and working on more revenue generating tasks. So that's a, a, a two benefits you get in one shot. And the last one is when there are no other options. So for example, let's say you want to be able to have an employee access their information, their, their uh, uh, certain records or, or retrieve information from another system, but you don't want to give them full access to that environment. So through automation, you can actually set it up that a user can go and request data. The system can determine should the user uh, be allowed to see the data or not, and if so, bring it back to them. 
So those are some of the key factors of why you why organizations are, are often looking at automation. All right, so what are we going to do about what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to give you a very quick overview of um, where do you get help? Because we're talking about, you know, getting stuck. So where do you go to get information about uh, the Power Platform? Uh, we'll then dive in and talk a little bit about Power Platform solutions. Um, a lot of people, they start using Power Platform. They don't, they've never heard of solutions. They don't know what they are and how they work. Uh, then we'll go into a little bit more detail in Power Automate, give you some, some cow tips and some tricks. Uh, we'll do the same for Power Automate, uh, Power Apps later. And then uh, if time permitting, we're going to leave it open for questions. So um, Power Platform, it's essentially a family of products that work together. Uh, we have Power BI for analytics and dashboarding. Power Apps is your, your user facing um, uh, tool for building very feature rich and, and visual apps that you can interact with on your phone, on your tablet, on your desktop. Power, Auto, Power Automate is the workhorse. That's where you're getting a lot of the, the workflow and the automation happening. Um, and then the newest member to the family is Power Virtual Agent. Uh, this allows you to build chatbots that you can interact with very, very quickly, literally in minutes, you can stand up a bot. Um, and it can then leverage Power Automate and some of the other tools to retrieve information and reach out to all this data. And then one layer below that, we have Dataverse, which is some of you may know as the Common Data Service or CDS. It was recently renamed. This is where you can um, store your, your related data in the cloud as part of the platform and access it and manipulate it. We have AI Builder. <clears throat> AI Builder is uh, essentially a level up from just building a simple workflow or a simple app. You can actually make it understand the text, understand sentiment, do translations, read a form, and actually read, read uh, text from an actual uh, receipt or so some sort of image to understand what it's looking at. So it further allows you to automate your processes. Uh, we have data connectors. So there are probably over uh, three, I think 3,000 different connectors out there. Tons of them. They're constantly being added every single month by third parties, by Microsoft. Um, and what they allow you to do is access the information very quickly and, and, and work with it. And the one other thing that is not showing here is part of our Power Automate mm -hmm. is the RPA solution, which is now called the, uh, the desktop flows, uh, which in the past used to be called UI flow or um, uh, with automation. So how do you go about keeping up to date? Um, there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, one of the main ones is, is actually the, the Power Automate documentation site. Um, it got a great bunch of information in there, everything from, you know, from basic information down right up to the more advanced stuff, working with the Dataverse, that sort of thing. Um, we have a bit of a, you know, just kind of a screenshot from there. You can see here, you can actually look for topics on how do you integrate, integrate with flows or sorry, teams, how do you integrate with um, forms. So the actual Microsoft Power Automate documentation site is, is really good. Now to build on that, you know, there's also the Power Automate community site and we've got the link in that in the slide there. Um, it's, it's more of a forum. Um, people can go in there, ask questions. They can post solutions they've had. You know, how do I do this? And it's really active. There's lots of people in there helping out um, and you can get lots of assistance there as well. There's community blogs, um, things like people like myself and Hanyel, um, John Liu, uh, John Levesque, um, lots of information. Um, when I say the community blog sites, that can be more than just a text blog site. You can talk about YouTube videos, lots of people out there with YouTube videos. Um, Hanyel, you have what, Flow in a, flow in a Minute? Something like that. So he has an old, building a flow out in a minute, that sort of thing. So there's lots of opportunity out there. The key thing to remember here is, is everyone has their different bits of focus. So you need to find the the um, you know the blog sites that kind of work towards the things that you're working on or you're interested in. Same thing with Power Apps. So Power Apps, Microsoft has their own docs as well. Um, again, it looks very similar to the Power Automate site. Again, it's laid out very similar to the Power Automate site. Um, with you know everything ranging from beginner to more complex. How do you build it? Actually integrating with uh, solutions in ALM. So there's lots of options there available as well. Again, just like the Power Automate site, you have a Power Apps community site. Same thing, very much a, a forum-based area, lots of activity there again as well. 
and again, some community sites as well. Um, Shane Young, uh, Haniel, myself, Daniel Christensen, a lot of it is, is out there. There's lots of people out there blogging about it, lots of, lots of assistance out there. And it's just, again, just a matter of finding what, what suits uh, your needs. Now, um, a lot of times people, they're learning, right? And it's, it's a, a natural tendency to try to get certifications, right? To prove yourself. Uh, so a couple of years ago, Microsoft started putting out some certifications. So you've got the PL900, which is the, the foundational. Uh, it really covers the, the, uh, at a really high level, the Power Automate, the Power, um, uh, power Apps, uh, some Power BI. And then there is kind of more advanced levels, uh, PL100, 200, and 400. And there's now a PL, a PL 600, which is the, the architect level um, that is being in, it's in beta. So you'll soon be able to, uh, to write it to make it an official certification. Um, and the topics covered are really the main uh, workloads that, that I discussed previously, which is the ones listed, data first, um, you know, power apps, both model driven as well as Canvas uh, apps. Uh, and then you've got the automate, the Power BI and the virtual agents. All right, so I talked a little bit about solutions. So what are solutions? When you think about building power apps and flows, there's often, uh, they're used together. They're not all in isolation. When you build a solution, you're essentially taking a collection of your power apps and your, uh, your power automate flows. You may have some dashboards, Power BI dashboards, some reports, and you want to treat them as a single unit when you're doing development and when you move then from development to QA to production. The way that you do that is by building solutions. And so there's two types of solutions generally available. You have what is called a managed solution and unmanaged. When you are doing development and you're kind of building the core of it, you're going to be building it as unmanaged and then it, you kind of move it through the different environments. Once it's ready to be released to your, your user community, and depending on who the community is, it could be somebody within your company or it could be a company that is building a solution that is then going to be used by another company. So that is when it, when it's being um, essentially uh, set to be managed, which means that whatever is managed cannot be changed. You can build on top of it. So in this example, we have system solutions that are provided by Microsoft. Whenever you spin up an environment or you start using uh, Dataverse, there is a number of solutions that are already there. You cannot modify them. What you can do is you can then start building on top of them. So you see on the screen, we've got solution A, uh, which has a first version 1.0, and then you can start adding patches to that solution. Um, over time, you know, it, it gets more and more um, uh, enhanced. And then once you get all those patches packed together, you then could do a version 2.0, um, and then you could release that solution to the users and they may want to add some fields or make some modifications, but to them, it's going to be an un unmanaged layer. So anything below the, the top uh, dotted line, they cannot modify, they can just build on top of it. All right, so let's talk about Power Automate and show you some tips and tricks. So the first thing is how do we start, how do we trigger an actual Power Flow or Power Automate Flow? How do we get it going? So there are five ways to do it. Uh, there's There are hundreds or probably by now thousands of different templates available for very common business use cases. Uh, when I get uh, an email with an attachment, I want to extract that email and place it in my OneDrive. There's probably a template available for that. And so you can actually, when you go to Power Automate, you can go to uh, create from a template and you can just type it some of the names of the connectors you're looking for, the services. It's going to give you options available. When you select the template, it will then show you the full flow. Typically, what you need to do is give it all of your, connect your, your connections, your credentials. Uh, if they aren't already in the system, and that's it, and you have a you have a flow that's built, you can then go modify to your specific needs. So that is one option. Um, you can actually build flows in Visio, laid out. There's a certain structure you need to follow, but once you have that Visio document, you can actually import it into Flow, and it can then go and generate that flow for you. Uh, and then, in terms of if you were to start from scratch and you want to build a flow, there are three different types of triggers available to you. Automated means that there is some sort of an event that takes place in a system. Uh, somebody, like I said, you received an email. Um, that's a trigger. Somebody placed an item in Dataverse, or uh, somebody uploaded the document into SharePoint, or somebody did something in ServiceNow, or in any one of those hundreds of systems I talk about. Um, those are all automated triggers that, that can kick off your workflow. 
uh, instant. So if you're dealing with a power app that runs a power automate flow in the back end, pressing a button on that power app would, con would constitute a, an automate or an instant uh, trigger. Um, or there are actually physical triggers you can buy. There's companies like uh, Flick and Button, BTPN, where you press the button and it actually will connect to the service and say, oh, button has been pressed, run the flow. Um, so those are a couple of examples, as well as when you're running the, the Power Automate app on your phone uh, and you have any apps that have the instant trigger, you will actually see a button, uh, a visual button on the screen and you can press it and that's going to start your flow. And then we have the scheduled ones, which you can say, for example, every day or every month or whatever the period might be, uh, the workflow is going to wake up and it's going to start doing something. OK, um, so variables, what are they? Why are they important? So anybody who's done development before of any sort, um, the idea behind variable, it's, it's something that holds a value. The value can be a string, it can be a number, it can be a, a Boolean like yes or no. Uh, it can even be an array or a whole uh, collection of information. So that's what they're used for. Um, okay. Thank you. So, Caltech. Um, so you need to initialize them. Uh, you can initialize them actually anywhere you want uh, throughout your workflow. Typically, best practice or recommended practices is to do it early on in your application. Uh, you cannot do it within a loop. You cannot do it within an if statement. It has to be at the top layer. And by top layer, we just mean that it can't be embedded in any other place. So uh, along with, with your variables, there's also constants. So things that do not change at all to the, the extent of your, of your flow. Um, and the idea behind it is it allows you to set the values. You don't have to go get the values. You don't have to, um, you don't have to run the risk of, of things being changed farther down in your flow. So you set them at the, the top level, as, as, as uh, Haniel was talking about, and you set them at the beginning of your flow, and you, um, you, you can set them, and once they're set, they're, they're that value for the entire um, life cycle of that flow. Now, the problem is, is you run into what's called, a, we, we call a giraffe. And so what a giraffe is here, let me just uh, show that on the screen here. Where's my screen? All right, so a draft looks like this. So you have all of these constants right at the very beginning of your um, your your uh, your flow, and it takes up a lot of space, and it doesn't really affect anything. It it doesn't cause any slowness, doesn't slow down your your. It just looks really bad, and kind of gets hard to keep an eye on, because it pushes everything down. Now, you know what what if I told you that you didn't have to do that? What if you could have all of your your constants declared in one action? So here's our for here's a cow tip. So now why would this be important? And what it, what it does is actually you know um, again you're 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 pulling it all into um, one at a time. And what you're looking at here is if we take a look at this um, this action here, I've, I've pulled it all into one JSON parser and I've declared it in there. And what that gives me in the end is I've gone from this really long giraffe's neck into this very, very short, all the same constants are here, but it's all in one action. And all I'm doing is I'm declaring it, I've, I've given it my schema, I've set the values, and from now on, these constants exist in the entire flow and I don't have to have this long giraffe, giraffe neck anymore. So it allows us to, to build it all into one activity um, and one thing you need to remember is just like um, regular constants, anything declared in that JSON parse string um, is, is, is not dynamic. It cannot be changed. It has to be maintained throughout the, the entire life cycle of the flow, and it will not um, uh, be, allow you to change it anywhere else in the, in the flow. Now, uh, like any other development uh, programming language, you have conditions, and conditions are basically um, you, you give it a piece of data, and if a condition is true, you can go down one branch in your workflow. If it's false, you can go down a different branch. You can also combine uh, different parameters or, or different variables together to give you some logic. So you can see on the right-hand side, it's checking a city to be either Regina or Calgary, and the employee is not Dave, right? So rather than having to build three different if statements, you can combine them with the 
the uh, and or logic directly into a single action. Now they're great in in your flow in in kind of your, your business logic, but you got to be careful when it comes to overusing conditions. What happens is there is actually a limit of eight nested uh, if statements or conditions that you can have within a single um, instance. If you start to go deeper than than a nesting of eight levels, you're actually going to see errors popping up, and it also just trying to visualize it is really difficult. So if you look at right now this workflow that you can see how, how complex it becomes and then imagine you're working on a single screen, it can be quite tedious um, to actually try to follow it. So there are actually better ways of uh, uh, treating conditions and flapping them out. So one of the ways to do it is using terminates. Um, and actually using only one side of the branch. So the idea is that you're saying, okay, if a condition is true, then do something. And if you can, then just terminate the flow there. Uh, let's say that you don't want the workflow to continue. And then everything from that middle, uh, the, the second condition, rather than putting all of that in the false, uh, if no, uh, above, what I'm doing is I'm actually saying, let that be the normal course of the workflow if it fails. And so what happens is I've, I've gone from having two levels down to only having a single level. Much easier to read and, and much cleaner to, uh, to code. Uh, and then we have switch statements. The switch statements are working similar to a condition, but imagine that you may have multiple outcomes. So let's say four, uh, three, four, you know, ten different options available rather than having an if this, else, if that, else, if that, or even having them uh, in, in a a single line. Um, this is another way to deal with it. The only thing you got to be aware is that you need to know the actual conditions or the actual options that it would hold when you're developing your flow. So in this particular case, the city, you have to indicate that one branch or one case will be Regina. Another case is going to be Calgary. You cannot make that a variable. That has to be a, um, a constant that you know at the beginning of the workflow. So within a flow, you also have the ability to loop, um, so which is, is kind of interesting considering the fact that you know a flow is, is very, uh, the editor in a flow is very visual, um, but you can actually create uh, loops within there. Um, in common, they're just like, like a for each. So you know when you have a set of values within the flow, whether you gather them dynamically, whether you set them at the beginning, you, you can actually iterate through every single one of these of these uh, items within that loop. A couple of things to remember when you are looping is that you can't force it to exit. The, there isn't any um, functionality today to force it to exit outside of a loop. And in fact, if an error occurs, if you have um, you know a dozen items in your in your array that you're looking through, and an error occurs on number four, it's actually going to keep pumping through all of the other um, errors, uh, or sorry, all the other uh, values until it's finished the array. And then it's going to uh, fail and throw the error uh, for you. Now the problem there is, is that it's not it, because of that. It's not stopping on the error. You can go back and you can see it, but the problem now is that um, it may have already updated all the other data um, in the in whatever you're trying to update in that loop um, because and didn't stop when it failed the first time. So. Kind of brings us to you know is is error handling uh, important and let you know how often do you build a flow and you don't have to massage data so you know as soon as you're dealing with data and you're 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 moving it around and you're maybe making changes to it you're going to want to have error handling and so how do we how do we deal with that well you know one really nice thing about this is you actually have the ability to do try catch. Um, so whoever are, you know, anyone out there who's a, who's a developer, you, you are familiar with these concepts. Now there isn't actually a try catch or a finally um, concept in um, a flow activity, but you can build that out using scope actions. So if we take a look here, um, we have in my, I have a flow here where I just manually trigger it and I initialize my values. Now I have a try. And in here, I will, you know, compose it, trying to take that value, changing it to an integer. And if it fails, I actually have a catch. And how do I control this is actually here. So if we take a look, 
at the uh, where did it go now? Configure my run after. So what that means is, is that normally any any activity that you run on a um, it, it always runs when the previous step was successful. What you're doing with a with a scope here is you're actually changing it so that in my run after, it only runs when the the previous one has failed or is skipped. Otherwise, it's going to move on to the next item down the list. So that's how you simulate your try catch concepts in uh, in uh, power or sorry uh, power automated. Now, all of the flows, everything you deal with in flow uh, in in a power automate is based on JSON. Mm -hmm. So all the data comes back. It's it's sent to different activities as JSON code. It comes back as JSON code. So if you're familiar with um, JSON, you can follow along and, and deal with the data. So we're talking about uh, capturing errors. Um, now, if you don't know that an error has happened, then you can't really deal with it. And so this is where the, the, the concept of fire and forget comes in. So you can have a workflow where it does something, um, there is a, a let's say, uh, a second uh, child flow that, that uh, they will talk about. But if nothing is coming back, if you're literally just saying, okay, I'm gonna run the workflow, I'm just gonna walk away. I'm gonna trust it uh, that it's gonna work, then you may not know what's happening. And what you wanna make sure is that you're actually capturing the information that's coming back so that you can deal with it appropriately. Um, now, related to that is the uh, handling HTTP responses quickly. So when you're building certain actions like the HTTP or par, uh, parse JSON, uh, when you want to pass a value back, you need to understand what is going to be that structure coming back to you. So Dave, can you switch for a second to that, that uh, constants uh, um, one that you had? Yeah, the one with the constants. No, that, sorry, not that one, the one with the parse JSON, sorry. Yes, can you open up the parse JSON? So if I didn't know the structure of the content, if that was just a single uh, uh, item coming from my trigger, I wouldn't know what the schema, which is the second window below, looks like. For me to actually assemble that manually, it would take time, it's error prone, but I mean, it's just, you don't have to do it. And this is where you can leverage um, a little trick that I like to do, which is, Initially, I just give it a pair of squiggly brackets, which says something's coming back. I let the flow run. When it runs, it's actually going to show me all the stuff that came back. And then you see the bottom where it says generate uh, from sample. There's a button right in the action. When I were to click that, I can actually copy whatever I got back from my run, and that will generate the actual mm -hmm. schema for me. So that's just a, another little cow tip on how do you actually get the, 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 the JSON schema that is needed. So there's also the concept of a child flow. And there's nothing, you don't, you don't just create child flows. Um, what you're actually doing is that you're having, you're having a flow that calls another flow. And where this happens, when you, when you kind of think of, of children flows, it actually is more of a concept within a solution. And so there's rules around that. So things to be aware of when you're building your solution is, you know, a power app in a solution, it can only see flows that exist in that solution. So if you're building out solutions and you have a number of, of flows, it's only going to see the flows that exist in your solution. If you are building a, a power app, non-solution power app, you're going to be able to see any, um, any uh, flow that's available because you can just call it manually from your, from your, uh, your, your uh, power app itself. But within a solution, your Power App can only see flows that exist in your solution. Um, and things that you need to be aware of as well um, is the communication around it. So for instance, let's take a look at the graph here. Mm -hmm. Is if we take a look at this graph, we're gonna see here that you know I have two solutions and a Power App outside the solution, it has no access points into that solution. So when you're building out your solutions, your power apps and your flows, they have to make you have to make sure they exist within. Now on the other side, though, is that a a flow 
has the ability to access flows outside of the solution. So if we're taking a look at at this this um, piece right here, this branch right here, we're actually seeing that I have a flow or a power app. It calls a flow, and then using HTTP, I can call flows both inside my solution and outside my solution. Um, what I can't do is I can't have a power app that accesses a flow inside, but I can I can actually access other flows um, from that power that power app solution within. Now. The, if you have multiple solutions, you will not be able to see um, any flows from one flow to in solution A to solution B, but you can call those flows using an HTTP call. So the idea behind it is that a child flow is an action inside of a solution, um, but a, if you need to access a flow that is no longer in your solution or not in your solution, you have to use an HTTP call. Now, HTTP calls, um, will require a elevated license within your tenant, a solution, uh, a child flow is actually part of whatever uh, your solution licensing is. Great. All right, let's talk about dynamic content. So when you start getting into building these kind of workflows, sooner or later, you're going to have to, to roll up your sleeves and start looking at the actual uh, workflow definition language or WDL in short. And sometimes you want to understand, well, I see this purple HTTP body, but what is the actual representation of that in uh, in my workflow definition language? And so by hovering your mouse on top of it, you can actually see what it is. So if you wanted to alter it, for example, so rather than getting the entire body, I wanted to get a specific value within my JSON object. What you can do is you can just highlight that that whole text in the body copied into your favorite text editor like notepad and what you will see now on the screen it puts the little at sign open squiggly bracket and then whatever you see in there that is the actual um, dynamic value that has been added into this uh, this object or this this action and then closed off so i can actually modify it here in my text editor add whatever parameters i want and then i can just copy it back into my flow and it will it will resolve it and it's going to look like dynamic content again so that's that's a kind of a way to do it because what you'll find sometimes is that the the Power Automate editor is a little bit finicky in how it lets you um, modify these values. Now, the the Power Automate editor is in a little bit of a transition state where depending on if you're a first release or not, um, there's a whole new experience that's coming out that is much much better, um, but not everybody has it. So that's why we wanted to just call that out. Now uh, on the topic of expressions, so. There's, there's a whole collection of expressions that allow you to further manipulate your, your content without specific actions. So if you wanted to do just simple type conversion, if you wanted to go from an array to a string or um, a string back to a number, you can do those kind of things directly in, the, in, in an expression. You don't have to create further actions for it. You can do math manipulation. Um, you can even do things like generating a good or a random number. There's, there's a lot of options available to you. And the general structure of that is it, it's, um, uh, it has a, an action name, which is in this case it is replace, and then you have a bunch of parameters. Um, if it's any text parameters, they're going to be in, in single quotes. Um, in some cases, it'll be another object. So, for example, a an, like a, something coming from the previous action that you would put in. So, depending on what it is, um, that's how you're going to uh, access it. I think you skipped over once. Uh, oh, no, you didn't. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Sorry. Um, now, handling optional values. So this is important. When you are building expressions, it's very easy to build expression in this case where I have, let's say, get record parent child. Well, what if my parent doesn't have any children and I'm expecting to do an operation on child? The workflow will fail. Why? Because it's trying to operate on a null object, something that doesn't exist. Um, and so two ways to deal with it is when you put the question mark, it will actually check to see what it is and it will return null to you or if you're able to deal with the higher level and say, okay, I don't have any children here, so let's just stop there. Or using the colleagues function. This is for many of you will become the favorite uh, expression that's available. What Kalis does is you can pass it an arbitrary number of values and it starts evaluating them one after another and it will keep evaluating until it finds one value that is not null. 
So in this particular case, if my get record parent child is now, it will return the string default value. If the one, if the first one is not now, then it will, it will return whatever the parent child is that value. So Kalis is really, really powerful in helping you gracefully exit your, your flows without having them explode. So when you remove, let's move into some Power Apps now. Um, the, the thing about Power Apps is that when you're thinking about working with a Power App, you need to think about Excel. Um, you know, think of your app almost as a spreadsheet. And, and the reason I say this is because of the way that it works. You know, you can't, um, you know, you, you can't necessarily set all of the properties, but they can be defined by formulas. Um, as you change things, the app recalculates. So um, th there's not a lot of these really long procedures that you would write if you're used to writing code. You don't have these lot. You don't have these these huge procedure um, calls. You, you don't have that ability within a within a, within a power app. Um, but you do have those a lot of of formulas. And something to think about here is that a power app is declarative. So in, in this example here, um, our, our, our B1, uh, sorry, B2, its, its cell is actually dependent on the value in A1. Same thing with a power app. So if I have two labels, and or so I have one label in a text box, the value in my, my label is dependent on the value in the text box. So as I change the value in the text box, Every change that I make, it's actually going to make a similar change in the label because it's declarative. So it's, it's as something is changed, it checks to see if anything else needs to be affected by that change. And it does that throughout the entire form. So this is something to be aware of that you can't just call a function to make a change. It's all based on the formulas that you have within your, your, uh, your uh, Power App. So when you're starting out your um, your uh, application, you have some options available to you. Uh, I guess you can almost call them procedures because they they are built in and they do have some um, ability to allow you to run specific code or specific formulas. Um, so it's you know it's set at the property of your very first screen, um, and or, or not the very first screen. It's on every screen, but it's set as one of the very first properties in that screen. So when the screen starts, so when you see the screen comes up on your screen, it's going to fire off this on start proper uh, procedure within the app, and you can run whatever spe special code is. And things that you might see that happen in there is going to get data that you need within the, the Power App, um, setting some checking for permissions to make sure you have access. Um, you can actually set um, and hide different fields in the app based on your permission levels or based on your user group that you're in, and you'll need to find that on the on start so they can go and hide those fields for you. Uh, so like I said, and that, that, that sorry, I hit it, I missed, missed a, in the declaration of that being a cow tip. So that's kind of what you use this for, is, is for preloading your data or, or setting values on the screen. Um, you also have options here for on visible. So when the screen shows up on on the on your uh, on your display, um, again, very very similar to your uh, on start. It's just a different option or different procedures available to you. Again, you can use it to get more information, make changes, um, and that sort of thing. What this does too is that um, it's also available to the to properties. So when your property becomes visible, it can run special code. So now we're talking about a little bit about con con concurrency. So the idea behind concurrency is running procedures or running um, activities inside of your Power App at the same time. So kind of give you an idea of the idea behind this is that if I'm running a number of different procedures inside or in, um, calls for data within my code, you can actually see it. You know, it doesn't. You know, I don't have any timelines in here, but it, it it's kind of stretched out. But if I'm running it with concurrent, you can see the the longest it's going to take is the longest call. There's no need to um, uh, to run one after the other because you're actually doing it all in parallel with concurrent. So when you have data getting fetched and you're on start, um, it's very very strong suggestion. 
uh, is to actually have contain that all inside of a concurrent um, a call within the Power App. Um, so, and you also have the concept of global variables as well. So, a global variable inside of a Power App is available to the entire app. Um, this is a little bit different than um, context variables. A context variable exists within the screen that you're working on. And because they are in different scopes, you have different ways of setting them. So when you're dealing with global variables, you're going to use the set command to set the values within that um, variable. However, when you're dealing with context variables, you're going to do things like update context or navigate to that or navigate. Um, will we'll actually be able to allow you to set context values as you're moving into a screen. But the, the one you're going to use the most when it comes to updating variables inside the context or on the screen is going to be update context. Mm -hmm. Now, collections, again, a collection is basically uh, a table inside of your Power App. And you, know, you can use things like collect, um, clear, a clear collect, what it does is that if you're trying to renew the data, you actually clear the data first from your collection and then you re repopulate that data. And you can update and you can remove items from it as well. Now, collections are available offline so that if you are in an, in an environment that you maybe, like you're a mobile device and you know they can't always guarantee they're going to have access to uh, the data, is that when you build the collection, you can actually save it. And so using the command save data or load data, <clears throat> what you're doing is you're actually loading it or saving that data to an offline container within the Power App on your mobile device. And then you know you have the ability to actually view the variable, the variables and collections in in your Power App as they're being populated. Um, so even if you're building out the Power App and you run the particular um, uh, data collection or data fetch you'll actually be able to see that in the um, view tab of your Power App editor that will show you what values do I have? What's the current setting? What collections do I have? How does it look? And what this allows you to do as a developer is actually see how that information is getting populated as you are building out your, your um, solution before you actually even push it out to a site or to a mobile device to be used. There is also to the concept of you know of a, of a runtime variable, and you know these are just things that you know or, sorry run, yeah they, they come about when you're kind of um, dealing with some debugs. So consider when you're when you're building out your your solution is you know throw a debug value in there. It only needs to be there for the time that you're you're building out the app application. It can be hidden or removed later on when you actually go to do your releasing. But what that does is it actually just updates a value. Um, without you having to go in and out of the app. And so it just shows up, shows up on the screen. So it's just a bit of a tip that we've come across that you know allows you to actually um, view the content of that the, the app is getting as you're building it out without having to exit and, and look around uh, inside the app to find out what's being set. Now, when we start building um, more complex apps that have many components on them, um, there is something called the container. And the idea behind the container is that you can put multiple objects into the single container. And so if you wanted to apply certain settings, let's say you would decide that you wanted to have some logic to, to shore or hide a number of elements if they are related, you can put them into the container and then put visibility on the container itself. And then once that container is hidden, everything that's inside of it will be hidden as well. So it's, it's a, you're essentially creating that cascading effect. Um, and that is something which is often used when you start building, uh, uh, again, more, more logic or you start looking at uh, laying out things on the screen. Um, now, when you start talking about responsive design, uh, this is where containers become really useful. Because what you can do is you want to essentially determine the size of the container and then have all of the other components, whether it's text labels or buttons or whatever it might be, take a size, a, a starting position, and a width and a height, uh, and even font size, that is relative to that container. Now, one important thing to also, yeah, it's okay, go ahead, Dave. Uh, a couple uh, tips around that. If you wanted to build a solution that is gonna be truly 
uh, responsive in the way that it works is you have to do a few settings in your app. There's a scale setting, a scale to fit, which by default is turned on. You need to turn that off because what happens is if it's turned on, the app will always try to fill the entire screen, which means your fonts and everything is going to be stretching out. And that is not what you want to do when you're building a res uh, responsive solution. You want it to understand the width of it and then determine uh, through some, some math logic whether you want to go from, say, two columns to three columns and something like that. Uh, locking the orientation, you want to disable that because if you go, for example, on a phone or on a tablet from landscape to portrait, you want to be able to stretch that out. Uh, and then using the container control again, uh, that's what I just mentioned. You can look at your app width and your app height, and based on certain breakpoints that are defined inside of uh, Power App itself, you can say if it's a phone layout or if it's a mobile, uh, a desk, um, uh, tablet layout, then treat it in one way. If it is larger or smaller, treat it in a different way. Okay. Now, when you are um, just to, to uh, cover that off, when you're building Power Apps, building Power Apps and building Power Automate workflows, they work hand in hand. So, in many cases, when you start an app or when you have a certain actions, uh, and there's a few Imperial actions inside of a, a Power App. So most of it is declarative, like in Excel that Dave was talking about, but there are a few things like when you start an app, on start. When a screen becomes visible, there's the on visible. When you have a button on select, or some of those actions, and what you can do is when those actions are taking place, you can actually fire off an automate workflow. Um, and this is where you can use the automate workflow to uh, essentially provide your data that is going to be coming back to your app. Um, retrieve user information. Uh, maybe you want to create some drop down that is going to be based on a SharePoint list as opposed to hard coding it inside of your application. Um, really important when you're building these kind of workflows in Power Automate, there is, and, and, and again, if you think back of what I was talking about a few minutes ago around the fire and forget. So with Power Automate, always bring something back to your Power App. So, uh, so Power Automate knows, did the workflow succeed or not? And if it did not, provide some sort of a message to the user or do something with it. Don't just say, okay, great, I, I, I ran the workflow, we're good. Um, when you build a workflow and you're returning something to the Power App, when you change that, uh, we talked about schema, that you know the structure of the, the, the response coming back. If it's going to change, what you need to do today in Power App is you actually need to remove the Power Automate flow from your Power App and then add it back again. And the reason is because this, that schema is being cached inside of the app and it's not aware and it doesn't go and check for, from the Power App to say, hey, did something change or not? The only way to do that today is you have to actually remove the, uh, the, the workflow, add it back in, and when you do that, just be careful, save your whatever action was calling that workflow. Um, save it because once you associate a workflow with a, a button, it's going to replace what's there right now. So take a copy of your, your function. Uh, once you add it back in, now your Power Apps is going to have the, the latest schema and everything should work just fine. Questions? We saw a few questions that were listed on the, in the chat and we were trying to respond to them as fast as we could, but if anybody has any other questions, um, I've left my email address in the, the chat. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you want to add yours as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Feel free to, to reach out. Um, and um, we're going we're gonna to stick around for a little bit. If anybody wants to go off mute and ask any questions, we're, we're going to be here. We have a few minutes left in the, in the session, so. Please remember too to fill out the, uh, the survey. Um, there's the, uh, the uh, scan there. And again, uh, I want to make sure that we, we thank our event sponsors. Without, uh, without them, this would not be possible. So a big thank you to, to our sponsors here. And we did put it in the chat, but um, we do have uh, our um, information here. If you wanted to connect with us, uh, please do so. Um, both myself and Hanyels is on the screen there. And yeah, so if there are any questions, uh, we'd be happy to help them out right now. So uh, Rohit uh, had a question uh, around having two two users, and so I'm just trying to eat, to read the question. What is same item? What if same item is being updated by the same person 
at the same time in edit screen, once saved, it doesn't take the updates from the other user. What is the best practice for this? So I guess I think the question is, um, if two people are, are trying to, and, and correct me, Roy, if I'm wrong, but you're asking a question, if two users are trying to edit the same, um, the same record at the same time, I don't know, Rohit, if you can, if you're still on, if you can type the message. Yes. Okay. So uh, the best way to do it is when you do the save, that like you want to commit the changes to it. So if you're just saving data inside of your app and you're not actually writing it back to, uh, I don't know if this is in uh, in Dataverse or, or in another source, but what you want to make sure is that you're writing the data back. Um, and if you are expecting to have a situation where your users are going to be uh, oh, it's in SharePoint. Okay, so what you probably want to be doing is um, checking probably what what is there when you're saving. So you can do saves directly from within your uh, your Power App, right? You can use the submit, but the submit is going to just take whatever is in the form right now and write it back. It's not actually going to check to see, hey, did somebody go and change in the back end since I added my my. Uh, my value and that's where you can actually get into an information of overriding somebody else's change so one way to deal with it is building an app that or in your app just have some sort of a, a periodic refresh happening um, or even when you're when you're trying to commit the change you want to maybe use a power automate flow to say okay uh, i'm trying to write this value what's the wh what uh what was the timestamp of when i was actually retrieving it last look at what was stored is there a more recent version? And then the decide how you want to react, like you want to override it or do you want to send back a message to the user to do a refresh? So there's different ways of, of dealing with it, but ultimately you need to you need to check for that to see if something has changed in the uh, in the source um, because multiple people are writing to the same location at the same time. So I hope that that answers the question. That's a great question. Yeah. Any any other questions? All right, uh, Canal, are you online? I think we can probably pass this over to the next speaker to get uh, prepped up and ready to go. Thank you very much, everyone, again. Thank you. We look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Haniel and David. Thank you for, thank you for having us.